Hey, it's Tony Bruschi. This Thanksgiving weekend, we're taking a look back at some of the most compelling cases and conversations that we've had in the last year. Here's another one of those conversations. This is the Hidden Killers podcast with Tony Bruschi. This last week, I had the opportunity to sit down and have a in-depth conversation with private investigator Thomas Brennan. Tom is the private investigator that's been hired by the parents of Ellen Greenberg, Joshua and Sandy Greenberg, as they search for justice and answers in the death of their daughter. A death that was quite clearly a homicide, considering she was stabbed 20 times. Several of those stab wounds, fatal blows, which would make it a physical impossibility for her to continue stabbing herself up to 20 times. The problem with this is her death has been labeled a suicide by the Philadelphia Police Department. A department which refuses to investigate the death further and refuses to change the cause of death to homicide, which it rightfully should be. Why is that? Why is it so difficult? And why are so many refusing to speak the truth about the death of Ellen Greenberg. We discuss all of that and more in this five-part series, our conversation with Thomas Brennan, private investigator, into the death of Ellen Greenberg. New episodes every day this week, Monday through Friday, here on the podcast. Thomas, thanks for joining me. Uh, Let's start at the very beginning. How did you get connected to this case? Two friends of mine, one a retired dentist and the other a judge in the Dauphin County Court of Common Pleas, William Tully. Um, They both were friends of the family and the parents were struggling. Mm -hmm. And uh, they knew what I did, you know, uh, that I did, I I still worked homicides. So, um, um, you know, in cold cases. So they... Uh, they arranged for a meeting with the parents and we sat down and the parents told me what, what in fact they were doing. This was March of 2013. Mm-hmm. And uh, they provided me with the, the documentation and some photographs that they had, seen photographs that were taken by the medical examiner's investigator. Uh, and uh, I told them, I said, well, let me take give me a chance to take a look at these and then I'll get back to you. We did, you know, I did, I got back to them and uh, I told them, I said, well, in my opinion, it, it, it is in fact is a homicide. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, they said, well, the father, Josh, he's a uh, character. He said, uh, well, what's this going to cost me? And I said, well, I don't make money on somebody else's grief. I said, if you yeah. cover my expenses, go to Philadelphia I said, in back, I said, uh, you know, that'll be it. Sure. You don't have to worry about my time. And that's the way it's been. Uh, and that's how I got involved in it. This is obviously a very troubling case for obviously many reasons. One of the first most obvious being uh, the likely physical improbability or impossibility that Ellen could have stabbed herself 20 times and made it through 20 times uh, and and still survived long enough to do that. When you initially heard about this case and you you saw some of that evidence and you heard the story, if we're just focusing on on the manner of death, what was going through your mind when you learned about it first being looked at as a homicide, then a suicide, homicide back to suicide? What was your uh, reaction to that? I I started looking at it and... You know, I'm look. You know, looking at the crime scene. You know, and and there's, first of all, you know, you know, I understand what you know. The parents told me that, you know, the fiance broke into the apartment, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. You know, he, uh, you know, it was a real stormy. You know, I think it was the biggest nor'easter that ever hit Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. A lot of snow, a lot of snow, and uh, um, they had an early dismissal at Ellen's school. Okay. And uh, uh, 
the one thing I, I'll, I'll never forget what uh, they told me right right at the beginning. There were a series of phone calls, okay, about oh probably ten or fifteen calls, all outgoing, mm-hmm. and started with a code. And they said, "Look at this. Uh, see how see how she was she was re- evidently she, she was really having a problem here. Look at all these phone calls." Mm-hmm. I said, "Did anybody ever call them to see who they were?" They said, "No." So I started calling. Them. Sure, they were a pair of the children in her classroom. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the code was that they, you know, they didn't show where they were coming from. They didn't, you know, they didn't show. Ellen's cell phone number. That's all it was. Sure. Sure. So, you know, that's that's how things started. And then you take a look at, at, at the crime scene itself. The photograph, there are no police photographs. I can tell you that right now of the crime scene. The Philadelphia Police Forensics Unit was never at the crime scene. Why? Okay. I mean, that, I mean, wouldn't this just be a common sense thing to do with someone who's been stabbed 20 times? Well, what you, what everybody has to understand here, Tony, is that um, the police did not know about the stab wounds to the back of the neck or the scalp okay. until autopsy. Okay? Mm-hmm. The next day, the 27th. Okay. Nobody knew about those. So the police at the scene, okay, who said this was a suicide, and I have documentation to that, that effect. Yeah. They said it was a suicide that night. Mm-hmm. Okay. They didn't they didn't they didn't move the body, they didn't do anything. They never called the forensics unit out, okay? Mm-hmm. That night. The night of the the night of the 26th, when at 6.40, when she was pronounced by an EMS, you know, fire, fireman, mm-hmm. okay, Philadelphia Police Department fireman, uh, nobody, at, at that time, nobody knew about those. Nobody knew about the sure. wounds at the back of the neck. So the only thing they did was suicide, suicide, suicide. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right, right from day one, and well, the next morning, when while uh, Ellen's Ellen's being autopsied, the victim is being autopsied. Um, the the husband James Schwartz, the, the prominent attorney uncle James Schwartzman, mm-hmm. calls and wants to get into the apartment. Okay. So the property manager told him, he said, what she said, well, uh, let me call the police. So she calls the police and the police said, yeah, you can let him in. And this, so we understand the, the, who this is, James Schwartzman. He's a prominent attorney. He's part of which family here, Samuel Goldberg or Ellen Greenberg's family? Goldberg. Okay. So part of, Samuel Goldberg. part of her okay. fiance's family. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, uh, uh, the police tell the property manager, yeah, you can let him in. The property manager says, well, it's all bloody. Mm-hmm. The scene's all bloody. They said, well, you can call crime scene cleanups. They'll come over and clean it up. So she calls crime scene cleanups. They come over and cre- uh, clean and sanitize the scene. Okay. He comes in. The prominent attorney uncle and another individual can- comes in. They come in. And not only do they get a suit and shoes for the hut, for the fiance mm-hmm. for the funeral, okay, they also remove all of the laptops. They remove the victim's laptop, her work laptop, her personal laptop, and her cell phone, and all of her credit cards, her wallet, everything. He takes it all, including the fiance's laptop, also. Okay, so anyone who says that, well. You know, um, anything that comes out those laptops at all in the future can be challenged, mm-hmm. okay? Because the police should have seized those right at the scene, but they didn't. They left. 
Is that because they were they were still thinking of this as being a suicide, so there wasn't a lot of there oversight or need to take them all. Okay. okay. Yeah. And I have, I, you know, like I said, I have an incident memo by a uniformed police officer that was at the scene, okay? And he says in that, in, in there, okay, in his, in his report, in his incident report, okay, it's titled Suicide, mm -hmm. okay? Suicide. And it says homicide was there and so was the medical examiner's office. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, guess who shows up to twenty eight? Who at at the apartment? The police. Okay, to perform a search. All these days later. So now, now, the medical examiner said on the twenty seventh, this is a homicide. Okay. So now, because the scene was never ever secured, now they have to go out and get a search warrant. Sure. Okay, to go back in and search the apartment. Mm -hmm. Well, what are they going to get from the apartment? Nothing because it's been clean and san cleaned and sanitized. Yeah. About the only thing that you could do, maybe you might get some results with a luminol test. Mm -hmm. They didn't even do that. They didn't even do that. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast with Tony Bruschi. There's more to come in my conversation with Thomas Brennan private investigator into the murder of Ellen Greenberg. New segments playing Monday through Friday this week on the podcast. Be sure to press subscribe so you don't miss any of this very intriguing story. Stay with us.